Just like a handshake in the business world, your tone and description will be the first impression a reader gets of your script. Hi all, Hank from Right to Real here, and today we'll be looking at five scripts with memorable description. How can description set the tone for your script? Let's take a look. Tone. The first definition is a musical or vocal sound with reference to its pitch, quality, and strength. We're not talking about that. We're looking at the second definition, the general character or attitude in a piece of writing. Before we jump right into the examples though, let's clear the air a bit. Are these rules written in stone? Yes and no. The disclaimer here, as with any creative form, you should first learn the rules before breaking them. If you choose to break said rules, make sure your style, tone, creates a clear visual for your reader. That's very important. Amateur screenwriters are often too quick to point out that so-and-so breaks this rule. Well, this writer does it that way. And that's all well and good for those writers. They're the exception, not the rule. It boils down to, can the reader understand what you write? Everything else is secondary. All right, Hank, get down off your soapbox. Understood? Let's press on. One key characteristic I've noticed as I've gone over these scripts is that the tone often reflects the genre. Comedic scripts have a funny tone. Horror scripts have a scary tone. Big, loud explosions, fast-paced tone for action scripts, and on and on. Are you doing this in your script? And if so, can you be doing it better? Now let's jump into the examples. Number five, Aloha. At 120 plus pages, not the best example for plot and story, but I was really surprised by the description. The mighty and inviting sound of static, signals, distant snatches of high-tech communication, machines discussing the future in a language all their own, and out of this we hear, Happy Birthday! She is Major Lisa Ng, 31. There is no excess in her presentation, from her hair to her shiny black shoes. Her salute slices the air. She has prestigious Air Force pilot's decorations on her chest. Hickam Air Force Base. Under the vacation getaway cover of Hawaii, this is Casablanca, the crucible of white knuckle postmodern diplomacy and military might. All of it below the surface of a Mayberry-like town. These are the be believers. American spirit is not a cigarette brand to them, it's a way of life, and the tempo is rising. Ken Finkley and Mike Bixler. They are glib and cynical salesmen of the military industrial complex. Think used cars, and you'd be close. Ng effortlessly skips up the steps alongside Gilchrist. She is so busy studying him that she promptly bashes herself against the cement barricade. It's a painful sounding crunch. Similar to the story, the description was off the wall, unique, but more often than not fun, which makes Aloha a good choice for number five. Coming in at number four is Training Day by the great David Ayer. Uh, this story takes a dark look at the LAPD. Detective Sergeant Alonzo, in a flannel shirt, reading the paper in a booth. The gun leather tough LAPD vet is a hands-on blue collar cop who could kick your ass with a look. Jake, well, I was getting my ass kicked. Alonzo, you did what you had to. Alonzo gives Jake a beer and grins at him like a proud dad. Doug and Stan see Alonzo, react like they've seen a ghost. So Lou turns around, sees Alonzo, and quickly stands. It's tense. Like there could be a gunfight, Jake's hand creeps near his gun. Alonzo and Lou converge, trading serious questions and answers with their eyes. Pink carpet and porcelain kitties. They throw Jake into the tub, shove his face in the drain. Smiley turns on the water, Jake's blood whirlpooling away. Smiley grabs a shotgun from Moreno, thumps the butt against Jake's head, flips it, shoves the muzzle in his ear. Snicks the shower curtain shut to catch the splatter. The thing I liked about Training Day's tone was that the story was dark and edgy, 
and so was the description, the dialogue, everything reflected the story that Mr. Ayer was trying to tell. Number three is Expendables 3. Some of you might be scratching your heads going, hey Hank, wait a minute. But I was genuinely surprised by the action in this script and the description, just how much it leapt off the page and gave you that big budget, summer movie feel. A monster train explodes into frame, thundering down the tracks like a fire-breathing dragon from hell. The TED-70 locomotive, 150 tons of hardened steel, pulling a five-car train. Cockpit lights burning like two glowing red eyes. Barney swings the chopper in directly behind the train, literally flying two feet off the ground. The caboose guards look up, blinking like it's a mirage. A goddamn flying, effing helicopter is right there, skimming off the deck right behind them. Before they can react, Gunner and Caesar take out the guards with silent pinpoint rounds. Straining at the controls, Barney zooms up and over the jagged mountain crest, skimming the rock-strewn, unforgiving surface below. Jesus, that was close. The tension, friction, conflict between the young and old Expendables is combustible and raw. The two groups stare each other down. They continue up floor by floor, nerves on edge, fingers tensed on triggers. Behind every pillar, we expect to see someone jump out. Every corner, every shadow, hiding a potential ambush. And the script was full of examples like this. My suggestion is, if you're writing an action script, maybe check out The Expendables 3. You might just be surprised like I was. Number 2, Sicario. This story is similar to Training Day in that it has a dark tone, but we have FBI agents, CIA agents, police officers doing things the right way, the wrong way, all trying to take down a Mexican cartel. Frame is filled with a blue eye, as blue as the ocean. The eye blinks, and we can almost feel a breeze we are that close. Two doors swing open. We see the silhouettes of 12 people dressed for battle, rifles at the ready, barrels pointing up. They reach the door. A shotgun blasts the hinges. It falls like a drawbridge. We are underneath the plywood, flashlight in our eyes. As the hatch is lifted, two hooks with wires are visible to the, our left and right. As the hatch is lifted, the wires pull tighter. We see where they lead. Two grenades. You married? I'm sorry. Husband? Who the hell is this clown in the golf shirt? Divorced. Kids? No. Only a few more cars and the convoy is clear. But that would mean luck is on their side. And luck doesn't live on this side of the border. Macy looks out over the desert. Two coyotes are stopped, staring right at us. Macy makes eye contact. They begin trotting off, never breaking eye contact with Macy as though they are begging her to follow, while she still can. In addition to the dark tone, what I really liked in this script was the imagery. Being so close to an eye that when it blinks you can feel a breeze. SWAT agents getting dressed for battle like they're knights storming a castle. Heck, even that last one gave you a tense feeling and was a proper use of an ellipsis. And coming in at number one, American Ultra. Build as a stoner born, this script had two things in its tone, good action and comedy. A 737 taking off. Whoa, shit, loud. Mike Howe, 29, unkempt and scruffy all over, looking like a lot of a mess. He comes across as a kind of a smudge of a person, a charcoal sketch of the American slacker. Sheriff Bernie Watts, 44, who looks exactly as you'd expect a 44-year-old man named Bernie Watts to look. Adrian Yates, 29, a young hotshot if you've ever seen one. He's straight top gun, squared away, half poli -sci geek and half frat boy douche, with a haircut that makes you want to shoot him three times in the chest. 
Mike twists his way free, turns and brings up Krantz's iPhone, quickly puts it up against Laffer, Laffer's front teeth, and then slams his palm into the back of it, knocking Laffer's teeth down his throat. Whoa, yeah. Mike quickly grabs the pull hook of the bench press machine and slams it into Newton's throat. The weights drop, ripping out Newton's throat and lynching him on the machine. Mike jams the teapot straight into the guy's face, killing him. Wow, this is a lot of action to write out. Let's hope you're having more fun reading it than if I just wrote, Mike goes ape on these mofos. And then by far my favorite. Mike attacks, Laffer blocks. Listen, I've written a lot of action here. You know it, I know it, and I want this script to be under 110 pages, because come on, it's Stoner Born, not Kafka. This isn't Kafka, okay? They have, like, guys that... Fight coordinators. Guys who can make this look awesome. This isn't a comic book. We all know ultimately it's going to come down to what we can shoot on the day anyway, right? So just take my word for it that the fight between Mike and Laffer makes any of the action in the new James Bond films look like effing 1960s Batman. It's violent. It's incredible. They beat the living shit out of each other, and it ends with them repeatedly stabbing each other with screwdrivers before Mike buries a claw hammer to Laffer's forehead, and then collapses, seemingly dead. What I liked here were the action sequences were thought out, gave clear visuals. Some people said that the description and tone might have been a little too funny, too over the top, but I enjoyed it. It's a stoner comedy. It worked. And that rounds out our five scripts with memorable description. This isn't a definitive list. There are other scripts that do description and tone just as well. But the key I want you to take away here is that your tone should reflect the genre you're writing in. Does your script that do that? Does your writing do that? And as always, feel free to let me know where I got it right, got it wrong. Uh, use the comments that give suggestions of other scripts, other topics you'd like to talk about. Uh, if you enjoyed what we did here, feel free to subscribe and then come check us out at Write to Real. And last but not least, remember, write your butts off.